Hi, I'm Sarah Beckman. I'm on the faculty at the Haas School of Business where I focus my work on innovation, design, and teaming. What I'd like to talk to you about today is how to use systems thinking as a part of um, how you imagine ways of getting through this pandemic and moving on in the future. So as you're all well aware, we've been thrown a curveball. Uh, that curveball has taken industries from the financial industry to the education industry uh, to their knees. Uh, and we're in the middle of trying to cope with all of that right now, but at the same time, it's offering us new opportunities to reimagine how our industries, how our companies, how our organizations might look on the other side of this pandemic. And I wanna play around a little bit with the big toilet paper crisis as a means of getting into what systems thinking can contribute to our understanding of the dynamics of how our world works. So one might take a very linear view of the toilet paper situation. You might say that per capita consumption of toilet paper as it goes up, I would expect per capita purchase of toilet paper to go up. And with some delay in ramping up production, I would then expect per capita production of toilet paper to go up. And if I were in the toilet paper business, I might amplify that linear model just a little bit and say, well, if there were to be an increase in intestinal flus, um, I might expect a, a, an increase in per capita consumption of toilet paper, at least in that period of time. Or if somebody came up with alternative uses for toilet paper, I'm like TPing houses, I might see an increase in, in per capita consumption of toilet paper at that time. Or on the flip side, if there were alternative ways of cleaning, I might see a decrease in per capita consumption of toilet paper. And those increases and decreases would then play themselves through per capita purchase of toilet paper to per, cap per capita production of toilet paper. So enter COVID-19. So the most immediate effect that people saw in this industry was that COVID-19 seemed to be driving a direct increase in per capita purchases of toilet paper. And there was a whole bunch of armchair psychological analysis of this apparent new fear of there being a shortage of toilet paper. Um, the, the psychologists offered that maybe this was a zero risk bias, that there was anticipatory anxiety about uh, toilet paper shortages, that there was a herd mentality. Um, so egged on by social media posts, uh, people started hoarding toilet paper and it, it appeared that the per capita purchase of toilet paper was, was increasing. And the stores responded in kind. They said, well, we'll limit purchases of toilet paper in the hopes of maintaining some level of availability um, in the stores. Um, which they, they hoped would maybe reduce the number of photos of empty shelves of, of toilet paper supplies that were egging on this, this fear of a, of a shortage. So that was the talk for a while, and there were lots of memes on social media about this huge challenge we had with people being so afraid that they were going to run out of toilet paper. Well, if we take back and if we step back and take a, a systems view of the of the industry, uh, we, we, we see a different story. So what happened when COVID-19 hit is that we started our shelter in place, our staying home from work. And something like 40% of the demand for toilet paper shifted from usages in the workplace or in restaurants or in other places outside the home to being used in the home. So the piece of the supply chain that makes industrial, those big size rolls of single ply toilet tissue, the, the industry that was making all of that uh, would have been caused ultimately to reduce its production because it wasn't seeing consumption um, on the other end of, of its supply chain. Uh, while the, the industry that produced the consumer oriented toilet paper um, was starting to see significant increases in demand. 
Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't geared up to be able to provide the required supply. So per capita consumption of toilet paper at home went up significantly, driving increased purchase of toilet paper for home use. And there's a significant delay before per capita production of toilet paper starts to, um, to go up. So in fact, availability of, of consumer toilet paper was going down, which was creating empty shelves, which was egging on the fear of, of shortage, which in, in this case was actually a, a, a well-based fear based on the reality of, of um, a shortage of toilet paper. So that begs the question then, if we were to look at this bigger system, how might we have uh, shifted a uh, supply of industrial toilet paper into the consumer toilet paper system um, or some other mechanism for, for supplying the demand as it had shifted so significantly from uh, in, at business use, at restaurant use, et cetera, into the home. So that's just an example of a very immediate issue in the, um, in the COVID-19 uh, shelter in place uh, crisis. But systems thinking has been needed for a while now, partly because of the radical increase in the change in technology. We're creating all kinds of ripple effects as we introduce technologies into the world. So when you think about autonomous vehicles, for example, you think about the most immediate effects of um, fewer people driving vehicles, therefore fewer people being employed and needing other skills that they um, might use to, to earn a living instead. Those are the most immediate implications, but then there are these other sort of unintended, more distant implications that we need to think about as well. So a student in one of my classes said, well, you know, autonomous vehicles should be safer to drive, so there will be fewer vehicle accidents, and so there will be fewer organ donations, uh, an unintended consequence that maybe we aren't thinking about. Similarly, the more people who don't own their cars, which is thought to be an effect of autonomous vehicles, um, the fewer cars we'll have, the higher we'll utilize the cars that are out there, and the fewer parking spaces we'll need, which opens up all kinds of possibilities for redesigning urban infrastructure. Similarly, in the health industry, uh, there are all kinds of companies that are producing products like prosthetic um, limbs or uh, devices that support or, or come close to replacing the function of various organs. Um, all of these collectively cause people in um, organizations that work on anti-aging, for example, to predict that there's someone alive today who will live to be 150, and that within the next two decades will enable people to live to be 1,000 years old. Um, so this is, back that off to 200 if 1,000 is too far for you to think about, but, but it does force us to think not only about immediate concerns like food shortages, but things like how do we structure um, the way we live? What does retirement mean? Do we marry for life? So all kinds of um, system implications of these seemingly incremental changes to improve our um, longevity and health outcomes. So this COVID-19 pandemic has created this great opportunity for us to be thinking not only about the responsiveness of uh, things like our toilet paper supply chains, but also when we come through the other side of this, what kinds of systems do we want to be designing um, that we all want to either live or work or learn in? And so uh, the pandemic, pandemic is setting up this opportunity for us to really um, think about the design of those systems. Now, systems design um, can be really, really messy at first. Um, so if you were to map out all the dynamics, for example, associated with the war on Afghanistan, you get a really, really messy, messy uh, matrix of all kinds of interactions that, that are going on. So here's the key about doing systems thinking is that in the present, it feels like it's, it's ambiguous, it's complex. Um, but as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life 
for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And that's where we really need to go um, as we dive into this systems work. We need to appreciate the complexity in the present, but be seeking the simplicity on the other side of it. So for example, a team of researchers uh, did a project uh, to look at consumption of healthy food in lower income communities. Um, and they identified the sort of central core of this systems map as um, purchase, if purchasing healthy food increases, then stores will view um, stocking of purchasing of, of healthy foods as um, lower. And as the lower the risk of stocking healthy foods, the more they would stock them, which increases availability for consumers, um, which then drives them to, to purchase more healthy foods. Well, that's, that's a great virtuous cycle, but it's influenced by all kinds of other cycles, like the, my sense of my state of health when I do eat um, healthy foods versus the appeal of unhealthy foods. Uh, influenced by all kinds of marketing and advertising efforts. So then I begin to build out a deeper understanding of the dynamics of making healthy food choices. I can then embed those in community concerns. So I can look at what are the effects of employment levels, of income levels, of crime levels on the ability to provide healthy foods in a community and go even broader to look at um, how does social stability and support impact those choices? So in the process of creating a really complex systems map, this research team was then able to center in on key leverage points for making change in this critical system of engaging people in purchasing and consuming healthy foods. So that's really what system mapping looks like. Um, our, our objective in doing systems mapping is really to be able to engage more deeply as, um, as, a, as a learning organization that really understands how to innovate um, using deep learning, using systems, as well as design thinking kinds of methodologies. So David Cole proposed this um, learning model, experiential learning theory, in which he argues that we toggle in taking in information between concrete experience and abstract conceptualization. And we toggle in processing information between reflective observation and active experimentation. And what that learning model sets up are four basic um, innovation capabilities that we need to develop as individuals, as teams, as organizations. And so those capabilities include observing and noticing, taking in information uh, about the concrete world, particularly at, with respect to our customers, users, stakeholders, taking all that messy information then and structuring it in different ways in order to identify the problems that we wish to solve for those stakeholders, customers, users. And then given that frame, imagining and designing, conceptualizing, different futures, different, different experiences that we might live, work, learn in. And then ultimately taking those abstract ideas and making them concrete once again, making and experimenting in order to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So in the design thinking and lean startup spaces, what that looks like is understanding people's lives through observation, identifying gaps in people's experiences, framing and reframing the problem to be solved, generating alternative futures, alternative solutions, imagining, designing those futures, and then finally making and experimenting, testing those solutions in context. We can put that design thinking work in the broader scope of systems thinking work and say that I have to not only observe and notice the people, but all the dynamics of the systems that that around them, such as we did in the example of purchasing healthy food. Then I want to understand the deep structure of those systems to identify the key leverage points that will allow me to make the kinds of changes I want to make, which then leads me to creating hypotheses and ideas about how I might intervene in the system to create different behaviors, which I can then take out and I can test and experiment with. So that's in a nutshell, a little bit about uh, the benefit that systems thinking can bring to us. 
and, and the um, offering it makes to help us design alternative futures that we all wish to live and work in. So thank you for listening um, and I wish you well in migrating from the system you work in today to the system you want to work in in the future.